looks like it. All right, we're going to start off talking about esophagitis. And I don't know about your practice, but I get a ton of esophageal biopsies. Uh, mostly now it's to uh, either for eosinophilic esophagitis or Barrett's. I'm not giving the Barrett's lecture. Somebody else is going to, I'm sure Dr. Montgomery perhaps is going to talk about Barrett's and dysplasia and, and that whole nightmare. Uh, but we're, I'm going to talk about the easy stuff, which is just uh, esophagitis, inflammation in the esophagus and how much you can do uh, with these small mucosal biopsies. So starting off, of, here's a picture. I, you might wonder, what am I doing here? I did my fellowship here back between 1988 and 1990. And uh, this guy right here, believe it or not, that was me back in 1988. Uh, Dr. Yardley, who uh, was my mentor here. Uh, Stan Hamilton, who's now the director of pathology at MD Anderson. Audrey Lazenby, who's uh, the vice chair at Nebraska now. And Scott Kern, who's busy somewhere here curing pancreas cancer as we speak. Uh, an, an august group back then. So it's good to be back. Uh, none of this existed back here when I was a, a fellow, obviously. All right, so what happens when our clinical colleagues do upper endoscopy and they tube the esophagus? This is the next Disney ride coming up soon in Orlando, I think. Well, we get biopsies from the esophagus. We like to refer to it as the goose. Here you can see the normal goose, and clearly this one is inflamed. And it's really easy to look through a microscope and see an inflamed esophagus, but that's not really the question we're being asked. We're being asked, what's over here on the side out of the picture that's causing this goose to be inflamed? And that's a lot trickier because it requires clinical information, endoscopic information. And when I usually ask people, well, how many of you get that information? It, it's about 10 to 20%. So how many of you get endoscopic or uh, clinical uh, correlations with your biopsies. Yeah, that's about, so maybe 25% of you, I saw about five hands. And that's usually the way it works. And without that information, it's much harder to have any specificity in your diagnosis. I mean, there are a few diagnostic criteria that we throw around when we talk about the numbers of eosinophils. But to be honest, in any clinical scenario, uh, th that diagnosis is suspect as we'll see. So various types of esophagitis I'm going to talk about. Uh, reflux, uh, most of the time we're talking about acidic reflux, but there are people who believe that alkaline reflux is actually even more damaging to the esophagus, which is bad news for the pharmaceutical companies who make billions of dollars suppressing everybody's gastric acid. Uh, allergic or eosinophilic esophagitis is probably what we'll talk about most. We'll talk a little bit about pill-induced lesions, and then we'll finish up with my favorite topic, which is infections. So reflux disease uh, it has a lot of different clinical manifestations. It's by far the most common form of esophagitis, but it's not necessarily the most common thing to get biopsy. Uh, clinicians have a whole grading scale, the LA classification for what they think is esophagitis through the endoscope based on how red and how uh, ulcerated things look. Uh, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. I think they have a hard time distinguishing ulcers from barriers and mucosa. Uh, that's one of the reasons we get biopsies. Uh, but there is a, a grading scale that they use. Uh, histologically, the things that we look at, which we'll look at in a second, really are just things of chronic irritation. There's nothing magic about what reflux does to the esophagus. Uh, uh, and uh, really, if you wanted to measure this precisely, there's now a little... Uh, pH monitor called a Bravo capsule, which is uh, put in endoscopically. They stick it under the side of your esophagus about two centimeters above the Z line, and it will send out every hour a pH reading to a handheld device. So it's sort of like a Holter monitor for your esophageal pH, and that will really tell you whether you're having reflux or not, or at least tell you that the pH of your esophagus is abnormal. Uh, we talk about what causes heartburn. It's pretty much any Anything that's good to eat or drink, uh, caffeine, alcohol, chocolate, citrus. I mean, but today I think this guy probably causes more heartburn than anything else. That's all I'll say. So what do we see under the microscope in reflux? You all are, have known this for years. 
we talk about basal zone hyperplasia. This is just squamous hyperplasia. Normally in the esophagus, the basal layer is about two cells thick. And in severe reflux, you know, the entire thickness of the mucosa may be taken up with basal cells. The vascular papillae, which are usually uh, below the top one third of the mucosa, will go up towards the surface because the surface is necrosed and gone. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll see a few eosinophils or maybe a couple of neutrophils. Uh, other things that are associated with reflux, balloon cells, we'll look at in a minute, and vascular lakes are on that list, although I'm not a big fan of that as being indicative of anything. So here is the endoscopic compression, the normal esophagus on the right, uh, and an eroded, inflamed-looking one on the left, and they have their LA classification scheme for how bad that is based on whether it's circumferential and how many centimeters are involved. And under the microscope, uh, we have a nice orderly mucosa here on the right. Notice that there's maybe two cell thickness of basal cells, and it's a very bland looking thing. And at low power, it's pink. This, on the other hand, at low power is blue, blue because all these cells are basal cells. It's very regenerative mucosa. Uh, and you can see here, these vascular papillae are way up towards the surface. Uh, and of course, this helps if you have a nice well-oriented section, which in reality never occurs, because these little bits are really hard uh, to get a nice piece of and to orient well. Uh, but that, in a nutshell, is the, the, what reflux looks like. But it's a very non-specific thing. It's just the most common thing we're going to see. Eosinophils, uh, before we had the, the eosinophilic esophagitis, we were ecstatic if we had eosinophil. And in fact, I remember as a fellow here, the pediatric gastroenterologist would routinely come over to look at biopsies with us to see if there were eosinophils in the things that we called reflux type changes. Or actually, the Hopkins term was the active epithelial changes of the type seen in gastroesophageal reflux, which when I went out in my own practice changed to reflux type changes, which I thought was a little more manageable. Uh, so we would feel very, very good and, and actually. Uh, the more eosinophils, the better, uh, but we were probably wrong a lot of the time. Balloon cells, these were actually described by Jose Jesserin here at Hopkins when he was a fellow. And these things, they sort of almost look like coelocytes, uh, very commonly seen in esophageal biopsies. And they're actually sort of half-dead squamous cells that are full of albumin. Uh, this is not glycogen. If you do a PAS, they'll be negative. Uh, and uh, these are frequently seen in reflux biopsies. Uh, but I think if you drink a hot cup of coffee, you can probably get some balloon cells because when you really look for them, they're, they're fairly ubiquitous. And vascular lakes are in the literature as something one sees in reflux. I think this is purely an artifact of the biopsy force of squeezing blood vessels because as you can see in the mucosa I've shown here, it's completely normal mucosa. They're just dilated vessels. Uh, and uh, so I don't really pay attention to those, but it is in the literature as being a part of reflux. And in the oldest literature on reflux, they talked about increased interepithelial lymphocytes, these little squiggly guys here, which are T cells. Uh, now, everybody's got a few of these towards the base of the mucosa and the esophagus. Uh, but how many is too many is something that all of a sudden people are paying attention to, because recently we've noticed that some patients that are biopsied to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis have lots of lymphocytes in their mucosa, and it's lymphocytic esophagitis, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that the old literature talked about having increased lymphocytes in reflux. Is it important to diagnose reflux? I think in today's world, that's the least of the clinician's worries. They're mostly biopsying the esophagus to rule out the eosinophilic esophagitis and to look for Barrett's. Um, but uh, and one of the reasons that the pediatric gastroenterologist would often come look at biopsies with us was in children with developmental delays and abnormalities, if there was reflux in the biopsy, they would often recommend a disinfundoplication in these small children because it was going to be a lifelong problem. Uh, so a simple diagnosis of reflux can have uh, big time uh, consequences sometimes. All right, so what about eosinophils and esophageal biopsies? Um, reflux certainly causes eosinophils in the esophagus, and obviously eosinophilic esophagitis and eosinophilic gastritis are other conditions where the eosinophil plays a key role. Uh, 
Um, but you can see eosinophils in pill-induced esophagitis as well, and very rarely in infections, but infections usually we're, we're, we're seeing neutrophils. So eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, this really wasn't very uh, popular of a diagnosis until the early 2000s. Uh, male to female ratio seems to be about three to one. A lot of these patients are allergic atopic individuals. A lot of them have asthma and other allergic conditions. And one thing to be aware of is some of these patients are already on steroids for these conditions, and steroids will very quickly knock down somebody's eosinophil count in that tissue. Uh, and so it's possible to have somebody with only a few eosinophils in their esophagus st still have eosinophilic esophagitis. The classic presentation is somebody comes into the emergency department with a piece of meat stuck in their esophagus. I don't know what it is, it's always a piece of steak. Uh, and it's usually young guys who've been out on the town having a few cocktails. Um, so food impaction is one of the classic things, and oftentimes you can elicit a history that this has been a lifelong problem for people that they've always had difficulty swallowing. Endoscopically, sometimes they see rings or furrows. Also, they can get strictures. And I guess cats have a ringed esophagus, so it's been called felinization of the esophagus. Some patients will have peripheral eosinophilia, but that's not really a diagnostic uh, criterion. Uh, so all the things that we discussed in reflux also occur in eosinophilic esophagitis. That's not magic, it's just chronic irritation of the esophagus. Typically there are large numbers of eosinophils. Uh, sometimes they're off the chart, uh, 50 or 100 per high power field. Um, we'll talk about numbers in a second. Sometimes you'll see superficial aggregates or microabscesses of eosinophils, uh, but this can be an incredibly patchy disease. And in fact, the recommendations are for gastroenterologists that they should take at least six mucosal biopsies. I had one this week where seven biopsies were completely normal and one biopsy was completely full of eosinophils. So perhaps you need to take eight. And here is an example of the furrows that one can see in the esophagus, these linear rows kind of looks like a cornfield that was just uh, plowed. Uh, and here's an example of the rings uh, in the esophagus. And so oftentimes the endoscopist will have a pretty good idea. And, and oftentimes this will trigger biopsies of the upper or mid esophagus in one container and the lower esophagus in another container uh, to try to help us differentiate that from reflux. Uh, when our gastroenterologists first started doing this, they put them all in one bottle to quote save money. And I said, you realize we can't tell an upper from a lower biopsy. There's no magic thing under the microscope. You have to put them in separate containers. And of course, the eosinophil. But notice there's tremendous basal zone hyperplasia here. Uh, you know, and uh, in this case, there's a little collection, perhaps a little uh, microabscess up here. When there are microabscesses up top, oftentimes the endoscopist will see little white uh, dots aligning the esophagus. Uh, which is probably the eosinophils themselves. Uh, here's an example with, that's just loaded with eosinophils. Uh, this happened to be uh, one of our former residents' husband. Uh, I had read his biopsies in the early 90s as severe reflux esophagitis. And about five years ago, she emailed me. She said, you know, you read my husband's uh, esophagus biopsies. Could you pull that out and look? I think he has eosinophilic esophagitis. And of course, I looked at this and said, yeah, he sure does. Um, but back in 1993, nobody ever made that diagnosis, uh, or almost nobody. Uh, and so a lot of people that were labeled with severe reflux uh, probably all have eosinophilic esophagitis. Here's a tremendous number of eosinophils. And sometimes when there's lots of them, they start to degranulate, and you just get this eosinophilic dust everywhere. Uh, and of course, if you're a counter, you have to see the nucleus to count that cell. Also notice there's a lot of spongiosis, all this edematous fluid that tends to spread out the squamous epithelial cells. Uh, and this actually now can be measured endoscopically with a, some sort of impedance device. And so the gastroenterologist may actually be able to measure this up and down the esophagus and predict whether it's uh, eosinophilic esophagitis or reflux based on the distribution of this uh, spongiosis, so they may put us out of a job. And here you can see these uh, exuberant little uh, superficial microabscesses uh, 
uh, of uh, eosinophil, and this was one where the endoscopist clearly saw little white dots in the esophagus. Well, how many eosinophils do you need? Uh, this is some data from a study we did, I don't know, about 10 years ago or 15 years ago when this was all the rage. And we looked at a whole bunch of patients and clinically decided, irregardless of their eosinophil count, what they had, uh, which is different than most studies, which say we're going to use a cutoff of 20. And then, of course, everybody that had 20 eosinophils or more had eosinophilic esophagitis because that's how they design their study. So what we, we just looked at people that had 20 or more, and the vast majority of them had eosinophilic esophagitis. Some of them had eosinophils elsewhere in the GI tract and had eosinophilic gastroenteritis. But a small percentage had reflux. Uh, and that's just to point out that, that no number is safe for differentiating these two. It's a clinical pathologic correlation. Uh, and there are people with 200 eosinophils per high power field that have reflux. We also had someone with only 70 eosinophils that clearly had eosinophilic esophagitis, but they were on steroids for their asthma, and nothing can knock down your eosinophil count like steroids. So how many EOs do you need? This is a look at the literature that was summarized in 2006, and you can see a lot of people were publishing papers in the early 2000s. And Randall Lee actually was one of the very first people to, to talk about this disease in 1985. And he came up with 10, and then there's other numbers that range from 5 to 30. Uh, and all the eosinophilic experts got together a few years ago and decided 15 was the number. Now, let's be realistic. Somebody with 14 eosinophils compared to somebody with 16 eosinophils, the idea that those are two different diseases is silly, but this was a number that at least would uh, is something that is talked about as being a, a threshold. Um, I don't pay attention to this, but if I don't put a number in my biopsy diagnosis, I'm going to get a phone call. Fortunately, I have slaves called residents. They preview the slide. Uh, they know the drill for these esophageal biopsies is they put a dot where they think there are the most eosinophils, and they count, and then they issue a report uh, with that number. And then I come along the next morning, and I eyeball it, and I think, wow, what were you smoking? Or no, that looks about right. And I tell them, look, a number that ends in three or seven, I'm likely to believe. If it ends in a zero or a five, I'm going to look at it and count because I can't believe it came out evenly. And I also tell them, look, if there's a ton of them, it's okay to say greater than 50. But our residents are so compulsive that very frequently I'll get a number like 147. <laughs> and I think, wow, you have better things to do than count that number of eosinophils. Um, so we do put it in our report. Uh, just to mention that basal cell hyperplasia, which we talked about in reflux, uh, when we compared them side by side, you actually get more basal cell hyperplasia in eosinophilic esophagitis. And usually the biopsies are really blue at low power, and it's, it's an obvious thing. It's like, whoa, look at that basal cell hyperplasia. And the same thing with the papillary length, the vascular papillae coming up above two thirds of the thickness. It was pretty even between the two. So they're both just chronically irritated. Uh, squamous mucosa. So, how do we tell these apart? Let's see. How many people think this uh, is reflux? Raise your hand. All right. How many people think it's eosinophilic esophagitis? Raise your hand. Nobody. How many people think it could be normal? Yeah, it could. There's like one or maybe two eosinophils here. I don't get excited by one eosinophil. Nothing else is going on. What about this one? How many people think this is a reflux? Most of you. How many think it could be uh, eosinophilic esophagitis? No takers. We got about six eosinophils here. All right, let's look at the next one. How many people think this could be reflux? One or two. How many people think it's eosinophilic esophagitis? Most of you are raising your hand. There's got a lot of spongiosis, it's got a lot of eosinophils. All right, one last one. Uh, how many for reflux? How many for eosinophilic esophagitis? Everybody raised their hand. Well, all these pictures came from the same set of mucosal biopsies, just different pieces of tissue. Uh, and in this case, the patient did have eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, but just to show you how patchy this disease is, sometimes every piece will look the same, but a lot of times some pieces will look normal and some pieces will be full of eosinophils. So A, you have to educate your clinician to take a lot of biopsies. And B, you have to look 
uh, carefully uh, to find the one piece that's full of eosinophils. So how do you sign out your biopsies? Um, we talked with our gastroenterologist and, and we all agreed that really what they wanted was to just know how many eosinophils there were there. So we say eosinophil rich esophagitis with up to X number per high power field. And they have the patient, they know what else is going on. They'll figure out the diagnosis. Some people go out in practice, uh, send us cases saying, look, my gastroenterologist wants me to decide one way or the other, which is it? And I say, well, I think you have to have a discussion with them because I don't think that you can definitely predict. And there was a very telling study uh, by some, a group at USC where they had a clinic of patients with severe reflux. These patients were coming to see a surgeon for getting a menisin fundoplication. Uh, and they took their biopsies and they randomized them with a bunch of patients that had eosinophilic esophagitis. And they found that there were no histologic features that allowed them to tell the two diseases apart. Uh, that is that some of these patients had tremendous eosinophilia. They had it both proximally and distally. So all those things I talked about that is more common in eosinophilic esophagitis were present in patients with severe reflux. So in an individual patient, I'm not sure that you as a pathologist can tell them apart, uh, at least without a lot of clinical information. So we don't even try. We just give them a number. They're happy. We're happy. My residents aren't happy, but that's life. This seems like a lot of work. Can't we just sequence something? Uh, people have been looking for biomarkers to differentiate these two, and this gene seems to be important, and we, we, we may, uh, or important, hmm, typo there. Uh, so we may be uh, 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 having a, a genetic test or an immunostain that will help us differentiate it. But so far, all the things that have been talked about haven't really come to fruition in terms of a biomarker. Well, what about therapy? What happens to these patients? Well, uh, a couple of things. Sometimes the patients have strictures. Our endoscopists are very aggressive about dilating these strictures, and that buys the patient a year or two uh, of being asymptomatic. Uh, but this is tricky because there is a risk of perforation of the esophagus, and we've had a few of those. I'll show you one in a minute. But what's supposed to happen to these patients is that they're first put on a trial of high-dose proton pump inhibitors. Uh, no matter, you know, these are people that are diagnosed with quote eosinophilic esophagitis by having greater than 15 eosinophils. They're put on high dose proton pump inhibitors, and about 25 to 30 percent of these patients get better. And so they've called this proton pump inhibitor responsive eosinophilic esophagitis, to which I say, yeah, it's called reflux. Um, but they're clinging to the idea that this is still a different disease and that perhaps somehow magically proton pump inhibitors. Uh, uh, treat this, uh, somehow they fight off the, the effects of the eosinophils, uh, who knows. Other people think proton pump inhibitors actually cause this disease, because apparently proton pump inhibitors can cause an interstitial eosinophilic nephritis. So see, people think, well, maybe that's what's happening in the esophagus. Hard to know. Uh, if people don't respond, in adults, they're usually given a topical steroid spray like you would normally use for uh, allergic rhinitis, and they swallow it. Uh, to topically treat their esophagus, or they use some sort of topical steroid preparation. Uh, this quickly can get rid of the eosinophils, um, but sometimes those patients can get uh, candidal esophagitis as a complication. Uh, if there's a stricture, they will be dilated. In children, they go to food allergy testing. They put the kid on an elimination diet, figure out what they're allergic to, uh, but for some reason, they don't do that with adults. Uh, there has been a trial of a, a fancy uh, monoclonal antibody for, against interleukin-5, which didn't work. To me, that seems like using a sledgehammer to kill an ant. Uh, but uh, whatever you choose, it's pretty easy to get rid of the eosinophils over a few months' time. Uh, it's not so easy to get rid of the symptoms. Uh, and here's an example of this uh, study from 2006 where they used this monoclonal antibody. And you can see the number of eosinophils went down dramatically after therapy, but the same thing can be accomplished with steroids and in some patients with proton pump inhibitors. Uh, here's an example of some of the strictures that these patients get. Uh, and because uh, of these, you know, occasionally when one dilates these, uh, they perforate, which is, of course, a surgical emergency. And here was one such perforation that we got. But it gave me some interesting insight into what's going on underneath the mucosa. You don't get a lot of submucosa in esophageal biopsies, uh, 
But what you can see here is that, uh, well, here are the eosinophils and the basal zone hyperplasia. Underneath it is this dense keloidal collagen. And I think that's what's causing the dysmotility in these patients. And you can imagine that even if we get rid of the eosinophils, it's going to take a long time for that collagen to go away for the patient's motility to come back. And at the very bottom of the screen are actually some aggregates of plasma cells. And uh, just for grins, we got an IgG4, and all those plasma cells light up. So maybe this is actually an IgG4-related disease, uh, as anything that seems to be a stricturing thing seems to have IgG4 plasma cells these days. Uh, pediatric radiologists now think that on an MRI, they can read that submucosal scarring and make a diagnosis uh, off an MRI scan. Uh, so again, they may put us out of business. It's important uh, to look at other sites in the GI tract once you have eosinophils in the esophagus to make sure the patient doesn't have a more generalized eosinophilic condition. Eosinophilic gastroenteritis typically requires systemic steroids, so the topical treatment in the esophagus won't do them much good. Oftentimes the presentation is a little different. These patients have abdominal pain, and usually the gastric antrum is the best place to biopsy to find those eosinophils. And typically it's not subtle like you can see here. That lamina propria looks red because there's so many eosinophils. All right, enough about eosinophils. A little bit about pill-induced injury. Uh, really, it's kind of like real estate to steal one of Dr. Montgomery's terms, location, location, location. Pill-induced ulcers typically occur much more proximally than reflux-induced ulcers. Uh, and I'll uh, show you why in the next uh, image. Uh, but there's a notch there where pills tend to get stuck. Here's a list of the more common co uh, agents that cause eosinophilic, or I'm sorry, pill induced lip injury to the esophagus. And it used to be in this country, doxycycline was number one. Uh, and it's not other types of tetracycline, it just seems to be the doxycycline that gets stuck in the esophagus. Um, you can see uh, quinidine, I, I point out there, because it can form a mass lesion that can look like a tumor to the endoscopist. Uh, but the bottom one, alendronate and, and the biphosphonates that are used to treat osteoporosis are large pills that can really uh, necrose the esophagus. And they come now with explicit instructions that you're not to lay down right after you take the medication. You have to drink at least, I don't know, a, a pint or a quart of water uh, because they're known to cause uh, really bad uh, esophageal necrosis. So here's a diagram of all the things that can block your esophagus from the outside. And notice that the uh, aortic arch in the left atrium, uh, form a, even in a normal person, can form a little notch. And that's where a pill is likely to get stuck. Throw in some heart failure and aortic aneurysm, and you really are a setup for having a pill-induced ulcer. And when I was a fellow here, I was a patient who came in who was taking uh, quinidine, which is on that list of things that cause bad things to happen in your esophagus, and he had fallen off the roof and broken both legs. Uh, so he was bedridden, and uh, they had to surgically repair his legs, and he developed an ulcer in his esophagus from his quinidine, so they put him on IV medication to let his uh, esophagus heal. Well, a couple days go by, and it's a new month, and the new residents come on the service and say, he doesn't need IV medication. They put him back on his pills. His ulcer recurred to the point where he got a fistula into his left atrium and ultimately uh, exsanguinated from that. So pill-induced ulcers, because of where they occur, can actually be a, a life-threatening event. Here is an example of this polypoid granulation tissue that uh, can occur with quinidine that can form a mass uh, that sometimes will get biopsy multiple times to rule out cancer. And this is an example, I think, from a Hopkins paper uh, of the alendronate causing esophageal ulcers. And you can see this somewhat polarizable crystalline material. Uh, you know, when you get an esophageal ulcer, if you polarize it, you know, it's not uncommon to find food and other stuff in any esophageal ulcer. But certainly if it's not a distal ulcer, I think about a pill-induced process. Unfortunately, there's nothing magical about the histology of these ulcers other than the location that will tell you it's a pill-induced process. All right, talk a little bit about lymphocytic esophagitis. I mentioned earlier uh, that one does see uh, lymphocytes increase or can see them have been reported in reflux. Uh, 
Uh, but recently we've uh, been more and more uh, interested in lymphocytic esophagitis in a couple of different uh, clinical scenarios. Uh, for years, I've noticed that kids with Crohn's disease uh, often have a lymphocytic esophagitis. And in fact, so if someone's under the age of 18 and I see in a lymphocytic esophagitis, I usually will bet the residents they have Crohn's disease and I've not lost one bet yet. Uh, in adults, we, we see more and more patients with chronic dysphagia that are biopsied and rule out eosinophilic esophagitis, that instead of having eosinophils in the esophagus, have lymphocytes. Uh, and uh, I think Bob Jenner wrote a paper on this uh, a few years ago uh, and, and said, yeah, this does appear to be a clinical pathologic thing, but we really don't know uh, the number of lymphocytes required. Uh, there was a recent paper where, uh, from uh, Dartmouth where they actually paid normal volunteers to get esophageal biopsy so they could count lymphocytes and come up with a normal number. And the, the number changes the farther uh, you go up in the esophagus, there are more lymphocytes the closer you get to the GE junction. Um, but for me, if I see lymphocytes and I see spongiosis together, uh, then I'm much more inclined to make this diagnosis. I think a case like you see here with tons of lymphocytes, it's not a subtle thing, but there are, are cases where you just see a few lymphocytes here and there, and is that enough in somebody who's presenting with chronic dysphagia? I probably tend to err on the side of mentioning it. Here's another example you can see here. Uh, sometimes the lymphocytes cluster around the vascular papillae, and you can see here that there's clearly some spongiosis and edema with those lymphocytes, telling me that yes, there's injury. Here's uh, the one higher power of the previous uh, one showing you a, a ton of lymphocytes and it's not subtle. Another uh, new designer type of esophagitis is sloughing esophagitis. It's also in the literature uh, as uh, esophagitis desiccans superficialis. So if you want to get a phone call, use that diagnosis. You know, for, you know it sounds much more like a dermatologic problem. Uh, we just call it sloughing esophagitis. Uh, clinically, what they see is this very dramatic strips of the mucosa sloughing off, and, and sometimes they think it's candida, and they'll say, rule out candida, and you'll get a fungal stain, and it's negative, and you won't believe your eyes, and you'll get another fungal stain, and it's negative. Um, but now our gastroenterologists are pretty good at, at differentiating the two and knowing what this is. Uh, some of my colleagues did a study at our place and found that most of these patients were on multiple medications and were pretty sick patients. Uh, but they couldn't come up with a single medication. Uh, the radiology literature has attributed sloughing esophagitis to Prodaxa or Dabigatron, which is a, one of those platelet inhibiting drugs uh, uh, for patients with peripheral vascular disease as being the major culprit. But I, I suspect a lot of different medications are probably in on, on causing this. Uh, and sometimes you'll see it in the younger, healthier patients. Under the microscope, uh, it's often often got a two-tone appearance with very blue reactive epithelium on the bottom and then this sort of red stuff on the top that's sloughing off. And uh, when you look at it, uh, it's often partially necrotic. It's almost as if something came along and burned off the superficial layer of this famous mucosa. And so it gives you that very uh, two-tone look. And oftentimes where the split occurs, you'll get little aggregates of neutrophils, almost little microabscesses where the dead stuff is sloughing off from the top. And of course, when I see neutrophils, I get worried about Canada, and I'll do a fungal stain, but it's always negative. Here again, here you can see this necrotic red stuff on the top, blue regenerative stuff underneath it, uh, and then this fields of neutrophils here. Uh, that's sloughing esophagitis or esophagus uh, desiccan superficialis. You want to be fancy. Last uh, topic we'll talk about are infectious agents. Uh, this was my favorite thing when I was a fellow here because I studied AIDS enteropathy for two years and was constantly looking for infectious things in the GI tract. Um, and uh, today's world, we have a lot of immunocompromised hosts because almost any uh, autoimmune or inflammatory thing is now treated with one of these fancy monoclonal antibodies that disrupt the normal immune system. And those patients are clearly at risk for all kinds of uh, infections, uh, transplant patients, and, and of course, HIV patients. Again, location and 
discopic appearance can be a help if you get that information with your biopsy. Uh, and it's often more proximal than reflux, but it doesn't have to be. So Canada is pretty ubiquitous. I think we've all seen plenty of Canada esophagitis cases. This is usually a more acute presentation of odynophagia and dysphagia, although there are patients with motility disorders that chronically have a Canada in their esophagus, and they have these classic sort of cottage cheese-like exudates in the esophagus. Here's an autopsy example. Uh, I think that's an autopsy from here at Hopkins, actually back in the day from Dr. Yardley's uh, slide set. Uh, you can really see uh, this almost caseous appearing material lining the esophagus. Uh, what I typically look for in a biopsy are clumps of necrotic squamous cells that have drifted off the main biopsy. And they're usually off on the side, the stuff that you typically would ignore, but that's where you're going to find the organisms. Oftentimes there's a little bit of neutrophilic activity in the superficial epithelium. Uh, and there are some patients, typically ones with chronic candidiasis, where you'll get big lymphoid uh, sheets of lymphocytes. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. And you'll be tempted to work that up for lymphoma, but don't. Uh, the pseudo IP can be easily stained with a GMS or a PAS, whatever you like to use for fungus. Uh, but you have to see pseudo IP. Uh, anybody can have a few yeast in their esophageal biopsy. Your mouth is full of yeast, and they often get pushed down into GI biopsies. So you want to see the pseudo IP in the squamous epithelium. And here's the kind of thing these epithelial cells are sloughing off and. Maybe in the front row, you can see there's a couple of hyphae growing sort of perpendicular to the axis of the squames. And whoa, down below, a couple of neutrophils to tip you off that, hey, maybe you should look here. Here's one where you can really see them. Most of the time on a good h &E, you can identify these without having to get a fungal stain. Uh, but if I have a couple of neutrophils and, I, and the clinically, uh, if there's a suspicion and I don't see them, then I'll order a GMS. Uh, and here you can really see how they grow perpendicular to the axis of the superficial squamous epithelium. And oftentimes these clumps fall off and are dead and just sort of off to the side. Here you can see a ton of both uh, yeast and seed hyphal organisms. This is one of those cases where you get these big chronic uh, lymphoid balls of lymphocytes. And you look at that and you say, ooh, I bet you that's a lymphoma. And you run off to the person in your group who does lymphomas. And they give you a list of 25 CD stains that you got to order. Don't do it. I, I've chased this tail many a time. You're going to get them up with, uh, these are half digested. The immuno stains are all over the map. You get a GMS stain and save a lot of time and money. Uh, a lot of people with, with strictures and other motility disorders get this chronic lymphoid reaction uh, to uh, Canada. Herpes esophagitis, um, this can be either type 1 or type 2. Usually in, in adults, it's type 1. Neonates sometimes at, at birth uh, can get a type 2 infection, uh, and, uh, which is a much more life-threatening condition than the usual reactivation that we see in adults. And usually the patient has some form of immunocompromise uh, to develop herpes esophagitis. Uh, again, it's an acute presentation of painful swallowing. Sometimes these bleed. Endoscopically, if the patient is scoped within a day or two, you're going to see the grouped vesicles, or they're going to see the grouped vesicles, just like you'd see on the skin in a dermatomal pattern. And then when these, when these rupture, you'll still get a group of clustered, punched out ulcers that the endoscopist will, may recognize as being likely to be herpes. Uh, of course, the viral inclusions are both type A and type B inclusions. A has a halo, B doesn't. And we all like to see these big, smudgy, multinucleated giant cells. Uh, and one thing that, uh, that I did when I was here at Hopkins actually was notice that most of these cases have aggregates of macrophages in the inflammatory exudate, which can be a clue of when to do levels or get an immunostain in an esophageal ulcer. So uh, this is a, an example on the left where uh, there are actual grouped vesicles that looks just like what you might see on the skin in a herpetic infection, and on the right, punched out ulcers uh, from a late case. This is actually one of Dr. Yardley's slides from here from many moons ago. And uh, here's an endoscopic picture uh, where you can see uh, that this patient actually has uh, numerous uh, vesicles here, 
as well as these cottage cheese-like exudates from Canada. And in really immunocompromised patients, untreated AIDS patients, you are likely to see more than one infection. So just because you find a viral inclusion for herpes doesn't mean you can stop looking for CMV or stop looking for Canada because I've had uh, several cases with all three. And here's a high power view. Uh, this is a Halans fixed specimen. My first year here at Hopkins, we fixed everything in Halans, which gave you exquisite cytologic detail, or as my colleague Henry Eppelman says, makes every cell look malignant. Uh, but we quickly realized that we couldn't get any DNA out of these samples. So of course, we switched uh, to formal in the next year and lost our exquisite cytologic detail. But this really shows you that you do get both uh, A and B inclusions, because these kind of look more like C and B inclusions with that halo, but you will see this in herpes and, and adenovirus as well. And of course, the big juicy multinucleated cells. Uh, this was a case I had as a fellow here uh, that spurred my interest in herpes. Uh, and it wasn't so much the infected epithelium in the upper right hand corner, but this diffuse field of these big uh, convoluted looking lymphoid cells. Uh, that we were a little bit worried could be a large cell lymphoma. Uh, back then, this is when a man roamed the earth with dinosaurs, we had one T-cell marker and one B-cell marker, and uh, the, there were like two or three T-cells, and that was it. There were no B-cells, and there was no macrophage marker. Imagine practicing pathology back then in the dark ages. We thought they were probably macrophages, but we weren't sure. And then two days later, I got another case of herpes esophagitis that had the same macrophages. And that set me on a hunt to pull out all the herpes esophagitis cases here at Hopkins. And I discovered that virtually every case had this macrophage exudate. So when you see these macrophages, think about uh, HSV if you don't see the infected epithelium. They often get pushed together into big sheets by the biopsy forceps. So, and right when the, we wrote a paper on this, and then right when the paper was about to come out, the uh, first, uh, what is CD68 was invented for staining macrophages. Uh, we proved that it was actually macrophages. If you're in doubt, there are plenty of good commercially available uh, immunostains for herpes that you can do. Uh, our lab has both HSV1 and HSV2. It's useless because every case I've ever had is cross reacted and they're both positive. Uh, and I never know which one, and I don't think it really matters. Uh, but uh, you could probably save money by just having one of those two antibodies. CMV esophagitis, again, typically immunocompromised hosts. The difference here is that oftentimes, or, and I shouldn't say oftentimes, uh, the dogma is that when you see CMV inclusions in the GI tract, this is a systemic bloodborne infection. This is not reactivation along nerve root like herpes is. Uh, and uh, at our institution, they're very quick to do uh, now, PCR from peripheral blood for CMV DNA. And when that's negative, I, I know that my biopsy is going to be negative. I've never seen somebody have a negative uh, serum blood PCR for CMV DNA have inclusions in their biopsies. Uh, the problem with that test is it will stay positive months after you, you treat somebody with CMV because that DNA is everywhere. Uh, but I think that's a really good positive or negative predictive value of that test. Uh, oftentimes, this is one big ulcer rather than a bunch of ulcers. Um, and of course, uh, herpes typically involves or infects the squamous epithelium. A CMV doesn't. CMV infects all the other cells that you can see in the esophagus. Loves endothelial cells, sometimes myofibroblasts with an ulcer, maybe even macrophages. Um, but it's not in the squamous epithelium that I've ever seen. Uh, and you get that beautiful type A cowdery inclusion and also cytoplasmic inclusions when somebody's not treated. In today's world, a lot of patients are already on prophylactic antivirals that are at risk for this, and so you don't get as good a, a viral inclusion as you're used to seeing. Here's a nice CMV ulcer, uh, and you can see even at low power, um, these uh, loops of capillaries where all the endothelial cells are infected, sort of in clusters. Here it is on higher power, you can see uh, both the nuclear and the cytoplasmic inclusions. And uh, notice next to here, there's a little cluster of my macrophages. And uh, it turns out that CMV will also have some macrophages in it, although they're usually not as exuberant as what one sees in herpes. And here's a sea of macrophages with one infected cell. 
And when someone's on antiviral therapy, the inclusions often look more like this, where you just get this weird uh, granular inclusions in the cytoplasm and the nucleus doesn't look as good. And sometimes you're not sure it's easy enough to throw a CMV stain on this. Um, but always hold out to make sure what you're looking at is really uh, a CMV inclusion because CMV stains typically will cross-react with some of the plasma cells in the lamina propria of an ulcer. Uh, <coughs> and I typically will ignore that. Here's a CMV case where it looks like this infected epithelial cell is in the squamous epithelium, but this is actually the vascular papillae. There's another infected cell over here. And uh, this was back from here when we had those beautiful holanstic specimens. Again, showing you this is a capillary here in this endothelial cell with a beautiful full-blown CMV nucleus. Uh, a few oddball things to finish up on, bacterial esophagitis. Uh, this isn't common, uh, but it's in the literature. And usually when I see bacteria in an esophageal biopsy, it's a colonizer because someone has an obstruction. And usually it's somebody with a big bulky squamous cell carcinoma in the middle of the esophagus where they have a diverticula or achalasia or something else. Um, but there are case reports of people going into septic shock from bacterial infections in their esophagus. I've never seen one. Uh, but it, it exists in the literature. This is what you more typically see, which are just some bacterial colonies clinging on to squamous mucosa. There's no host response, and this is just colonization, uh, which I typically ignore, uh, although when I see a lot of this in a biopsy, I'm worried that there must be some obstruction nearby. Uh, lastly, uh, HIV-associated esophagitis. In patients that aren't on antiviral therapy, we used to see a lot of giant ulcers in patients with uh, full-blown AIDS, and we would get the biopsy and you'd do a herpes stain and a CMV stain, and we even did electron microscopy here when I was a fellow, that was my job, uh, and we could not find a pathogen. Uh, and it turns out that for some reasons we don't know, HIV itself can cause these ulcers, and when you put the patient on steroids, the ulcers heal up. When you take them off steroids, the ulcers come back. So it's almost the opposite of an infectious uh, process uh, that somehow people thought might be due to immune dysregulation of the virus itself. Uh, don't see this much anymore because patients are on antivirals, uh, which uh, keeps this in check. Uh, a little bit about where to biopsy in infections in the esophagus. Canada, of course, is that grungy, cheesy, necrotic stuff where you're likely to have your best yield. In ulcers, the HSV inclusions are at the edge of the ulcer, and most endoscopists are pretty good about only biopsying the edge of the ulcer because we've told them, look, if you just biopsy the middle of an ulcer, it's going to be granulation tissue and pus, and I'm not going to be able to tell you what caused it. Uh, but the truth is, if you want to find CMV inclusions, that's the best place, that middle of the ad ulcer with all that granulation tissue. Um, most gastroenterologists are a little queasy about biopsying the middle of a giant ulcer, so they won't do it. And finish up with this case uh, where somebody uh, had this biopsy, a colleague of mine, uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, and at low power, you can see there's some basal zone hyperplasia. You've got uh, uh, the vascular papillae coming way up towards the surface. There are some balloon cells over here. And it looks like it could be reflux esophagitis. On higher power, though, the lamina propria has got a bunch of CMV inclusions. Oh, by the way, the patient has AIDS. You never find that out until after the fact. And then, well, there's some foamy macrophages around, but I told you that you see that with CMV. Uh, but my colleague was more anal compulsive than I was and got an AFB stain. And lo and behold, we are, we've got some acid bacillus and some red snappers here. You can actually see uh, the CMV infected cells down below and the macrophages here. Uh, so again, just because you find one pathogen uh, doesn't mean you're off the hook. You have to look uh, for multiple. That's a different kind of red snapper. Uh, any questions on esophagitis? Yes? So the question is, you can see a rare eosinophil in normal esophagus, but do you have to have eosinophils to call something 
reflux, uh, and no. Uh, I would say most of the things that I call reflux have no inflammatory cells. It's the comp, it's no inflammatory cells, no neutrophils, no eosinophils. Uh, most of the time, all I see is some basal zone hyperplasia and some reactive squamous epithelium uh, with those. Um, and yeah, no, you get real excited if you have eosinophils, or we used to, but a lot of times you don't. Um, and so I just say reflux type changes. That's my diagnostic line. Yes. I'm sorry, what? Oh, pericarditis. Yeah, I should mention that. Pericarditis is, is something that you can see in reflux. I don't see it all that often. Maybe I just don't look for it. Um, but you're absolutely right. That can be seen uh, in reflux. Yes. Yeah, so the, 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 the statement really was that a lot of times when they biopsy the, the GE junction or the squamous pulmonary junction, you get a, a fair amount of intense inflammation right in that cardiac mucosa, and the body mucosa below it is normal, and, and is that reflux. And for a couple of years, we got all excited and started calling everything active chronic carditis. And we asked our guests, around do you care about that? And they said, no. The only reason we're biopsying that area is to look for intestinal metaplasia. So we stopped diagnosing it. Um, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that area is often inflamed in patients with reflux. Yes? Does sub help you uh, with lymphocytes? Does subset analysis help with lymphocytes? Like that? I don't think we know the answer to that. I mean, I've assumed they're all T cells, but I don't know if they're CD4 or CD8 or, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. Number of fragments, um, more is better, bigger is better. Um, the gastroenterology literature says you need to take at least six biopsies to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis, and I actually think in some cases that's not enough. I No, I don't do that. I mean, it might be, but I don't. Nah, that clinicians don't like you when you do that. <laughs> uh, back there. Yeah, so how specific are those findings? Um, so uh, the caveat I'll say is that a lot of times biopsies with that endoscopic finding are normal, and a lot of times they don't have eosinophils, they have lymphocytes. But when you have the combination, I don't know how specific that is. I think, that, I think that's helpful. Um, I, but the problem is 25% of those patients respond to high-dose proton pump inhibitors. So I don't know that it... I don't, you know, whatever that disease is. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily know. So we have so. one question from one of our online viewers. Uh oh. Do you consider it useful for clinicians counting the T cell EOs and the average of EOs for a high power of EOs to follow up on these patients? Yeah, so the question is. Uh, you know, most of what's been recommended is to find the area with the most eosinophils and count that. What about the mean? And, uh, you know, is that helpful? And uh, for whatever reason, that's sort of been, I think, lost in the shuffle. And, and I don't think people pay attention to that. Um, we tried to get at that in our data, and it, I don't think it was all that helpful. It's such a patchy thing that I think, I think that's difficult to answer. All right, before we go on to the colon, I'm going to play a little music video, which will review all of the things we just talked about in esophagitis. And uh, believe it or not, this was me about, I don't know, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. 